Hello YouTube and welcome to my interview with Michael Payton. Thank you for joining me. Now Michael, for those who aren't that familiar with your videos or your channel, could you give us a bit of a summary of what kind of videos you make? Um, certainly I'd be happy to. Um, most of my stuff on YouTube has been happening over the last year. Um, personally, I work and have, have worked in experimental psychology, um, doing some interesting work in the field of cognitive science. I was contacted, um, I think, in about January or February of last year uh, by users Dawson American Atheist and Theo Warner um, about a debate I had done. Um, uh, atheism, theism debate I had done, uh, I think a couple of years ago now. Um, they were interested in the debate <clears throat> and kind of introduced me to the world of YouTube. Before that time, I, I had really no conception that people did this as a hobby um, and what a thriving community it really was. I had some idea that people did do that. I had... Um, I think I was subscribed for years to people like Lacey Green and to uh, Richard Coughlin, but I didn't know there were, like, I think now it's thousands of people making videos and commenting on each other and, and doing their own work. Um, so I got into it that way. And for the most part, my, my channel has been, I think, me learning um, how, to, uh, how to communicate effectively, frankly. Um, a lot of my videos are basically on issues around um, skepticism, atheism, sort of the political interface, but a lot of it is also in the philosophical area as well. Um, I tend not to do as many videos on uh, cognitive neuroscience or cognitive science generally. That's something that will likely change. I think I might be uh, trying to uh, play to my strengths in the next year, but for the most part, it was a way for me to start to have projects that were outside of my own field, and in that way, I was hoping to develop my knowledge base in things like philosophy, theories of politics, uh, economics, that sort of thing. Um, and I think I've done that rather well, um, and done issues that are, or videos that are more issue-based. Like, I think the most recent video I had was about uh, Nigerian um, the prevalence of uh, what's called witchcraft persecution in Nigeria. So cases where children are um, routinely, unfortunately, accused of being witches. And then um, they're offered the chance by pastors to be exercised of their demons. And these cases are actually uh, really important for us outside of Africa, especially in the United States and Canada, because those churches have strong links into the United States and, and to Canada. For instance, one uh, so-called witch doctor um, was actually treated as a guest of honor, and it was um, someone who's fairly prominent in Nigeria for doing these sort of, like, really what ought to be criminal extortions uh, out of some of the most vulnerable people on the planet. Um, so I really, I guess, use my channel to call attention to things that I think need to have attention called to them. Um, I'm not particularly good at doing things. Uh, there are some, I guess, parts of the YouTube community, I guess, internet community in general, that I, I still haven't become very good at. Um, things that are particular to this community, like the entire notion of uh, ponage, I, I find kind of meaningless. It doesn't really rub me in the right way. And so I've, I've done a couple of videos where I was sort of more belligerent. And now I'm, I guess I really regret those because it's not who I am. I think the best description of my channel and my work um, in all fields, uh, regardless of the YouTube thing, has just been to try to um, present the things that I, I think are relevant and do it in as honest a way as possible. I saw your video about the witchcraft. That was very well made. Um, thank you. Um, I, again, also, I consider myself someone who's learning, and I think that's an important part. And so I try different techniques. I've 
looked at different uh, ways of presenting stories and presenting materials, and I've, I've basically been experimenting with those different things in, in the sort of amateurish, dilettantish way that, um, that I think is appropriate for someone at my skill level. But um, thank you very much for the compliment. I think it's, if nothing else, that if it draws attention to that issue, I think the, uh, the, um, I'm doing some sort of service to, to that problem. Now, sort of turning away from YouTube, you said your educational background was in psychology, correct? Yes, um, mainly in the area of cognitive science, uh, which is sort of the interdisciplinary approach to uh, what we could broadly differ, uh, determine as a science of mind. So my undergraduate education was in cognitive science. Um, and that included not just psychology, though a lot of it was psychology, but it also included things like an understanding of computer science, uh, neurology. Um, I had a certain number of philosophy classes. Linguistics as well was in there. Um, a certain understanding of bio biological systems was also necessary. So my educational background, I guess, is, is very eclectic in that way. Um, and I think since about, I guess, 2007 now, uh, it's weird to, to say it that way, but since about 2007, been doing various re types of research with many different people in different capacities. So, again, the, uh, the research background is similarly very eclectic and very sorted. Um, I, I think that's, uh, I'm seeing actually that that's probably a common thing with me. So, what initially drew you to that field of study? Well, the, the main things that drew me to the field were actually kind of, uh, I regret to say, but uh, uh, frankly, a kind of hero worship. Um, I saw that um, many of the people that were taking up the issues in cognitive science were, I, I just thought, thought of them as astounding super geniuses. Um, and I became fascinated, frankly, just by, by the people that were doing it. So um, people like Noam Chomsky and Daniel Dennett, um, Ray Jackendoff as well, um, when you get into their professional work, you see that they're actually incredibly intelligent people, very well read on a variety of issues, um, like Chomsky alone has contributed to so many different fields so that most people make their careers in just with a single contribution to one field, but the, he's been a real seminal figure in not just linguistics, but also in uh, philosophy of mind. Um, he's been like integral to cognitive science uh, developmental psychology, um, politics, uh, communication studies, media studies, all of these areas he's contributed to. And for some of these, these are things that he did as side projects, just like in his spare time became a world-renowned expert on, on media studies. That, I think, is impressive. Um, Daniel Dennett is a similar sort of situation where he's contributed um, substantially to areas that were outside of his, his actual training. So he had his training in a, a type of very linguistically based philosophy under, uh, at, he was, he got his PhD at Oxford in the 1960s, which was at that time dominated by a very, um, a very sort, sort of pedantic, frankly, type of philosophy. But he's come out of that, um, with, making contributions, not just to the areas of philosophy, but also um, making important contributions to un the understanding of biology, artificial intelligence, cognitive science. Um, all of these, I think, are incredibly important issues. So I think that's re what really drove me into it. But after that, I think the actual nature of the problems became incredibly fascinating, and an entire world of research opened up to me. 
because you see in science we have the sort sort of uh, sure-footed stride of the physical sciences. It's always seeming to go forward in a very confident, uh, gradual way. So chemistry and physics, um, and uh, to a certain extent biology as well, are, are very well formulated. We have problems um, in those fields, and there's interesting and fascinating work that happens around them. But we don't have things that we might call mysteries. We don't have um, areas where we absolutely know nothing. Um, and I think that's quite different than cognitive science, where there are areas where the problems are so so vague and so um, poorly understood at this present point um, that really there is a, a whole bunch of mysteries that happen um, inside your own head before you are even reached to take a glass of water. Like those types of very simple actions and the way we understand the world um, with our cognitive capacities um, are still really, to a certain extent, in their infancy. We know more and more all the time, but it's still really an area that's, um, that's not very well understood. So I've even seen this development in the course of my own education, so since about 2004. Um, in fall, I was helping to TA a course uh, which was the introduction to psychology, and I was quite um, I was quite interested to see how different actually um, and how much has actually changed in even that short time period. Um, that compared to the textbook that I had used and still have, um, I noticed there was far more work on neurology being discussed at introductory levels. Um, far more influence given to evolutionary psychology, um, a lot of downplay of uh, more behaviorally based experiments, far less on, on clinical psychology. It seemed to be, um, I actually took as a, as a kind of indication that I had done something right, that I had moved in, in the direction where the, the literature eventually did head. Um, that might just be my own perception, but I think it was right there, actually, in in the textbook itself. So, again, it, that really does help uh, help the interest and, and keep you motivated to, to stay on, on course. Well, they say the mind is one of the last great frontiers of science. I think so. I think now we are at a point where we're beginning to understand co cognitive architecture well enough that we're starting to understand um, things that were, I think, real mysteries to, uh, to earlier generations. Um, and importantly also that we're getting really solid ideas of what's happening in uh, areas that were really, I think, the, the dream of people like Freud and Jung, some of the early people in psychology. Like Freud, towards the end of his career, was had thought, um, uh, completely wrongly, of course, that he had penetrated into the inner psyche and that he really did have some kind of understanding of how the mind works. Um, and so he started to do a kind of cultural anthropology and a comparative study of religious beliefs and um, and cultural practices and understanding them in the terms of the superego and uh, ego drives or id drives. Um, and Jung, especially with his idea of the collective unconscious, really was trying to do um, something that's much closer to now what we call cultural anthropology, understanding the mind in by way of culture. But now we see that actually the, the tools of cognitive scientists have actually begun to move in the opposite uh, direction, understanding culture by way of understanding the mind, and actually begin to make sense of things like supernatural beliefs or religious beliefs um, by understanding the, uh, the machinery that really makes up the mind. Other areas like consciousness, um, it still seem a bit vague, but at least now we have a, a much better understanding of how um, 
how consciousness might be realized in the mind. And we have uh, both philosophers and cognitive scientists who are extremely competent in neurological studies and experimental technique and have actually informed studies that do look at conscious apprehension. Um, and instead of things being like mysteries, um, where we have no idea where to go, um, ideas of consciousness now begin to actually have very explicit and detailed predictions following from their theoretical basis. So one such theory would be um, high-order representation theory, um, which carries with it basically the idea that we have first and second order perceptions, first order being basically uh, the uh, early on sensation and then a secondary set of perceptions. Now, there's a number of problems with that higher order representational theory, um, which come out of problems with computational tractability. What actually, like, where exactly would the first and second order distinctions be taking place at an anatomical neurological level? Um, and also just some of the experimental techniques that they see from trying to fool people um, in various ways with their conscious experience. So doing things like uh, change blindness experiments where they ask people to focus on one particular part of the video um, and then they don't notice things like gorillas walking through their line of vision or um, in some videos they do things like um, take the wings off of airplanes and it's um, from frame to frame. And it's amazing to see how people actually sometimes don't notice these things happening. Um, and those are some real predictions that come out of um, theories of consciousness, and they help us understand and explain uh, the mind. So it, it seems like it is a frontier um, in the sense that it's, it's still, I think, adventurous and exciting. Um, but we at least have the map, and we some, have some tools and a compass, and we, we have some of the, the tools and um, understanding that would be necessary to go and start to explain the way we really understand the world. Now, we've talked a lot about your background and your inspiration, but are you doing any current research or work? Yeah, my current work, actually, I I just left York University. Um, I had been there for a while, um, just doing research in, I think, many different areas. Um, and now my work has gone into, um, I've been working with a company in Toronto that does what's called thought-controlled computing. So they're really interested in seeing the um, uh, the possibility of creating applications for either personal use or medical use of um, how to read people's brainwaves as a sort of interface, interface to um, computer programs. So the brain itself gives off at various different locations different kinds of waves, so like alpha waves, beta waves, at, at different like, frequencies. Um, and those can be read by relatively simple um, electronic devices. Now, the, the idea is that we can use these different brain waves at different places um, to inform a computer program about the, well, basically about <laughs> anything as people become more able to ch consciously change their brain waves. Um, they're able to do things like potentially um, learn how to move a cursor on a computer screen. Uh, there's uh, developing the possibility of uh, the movement of robotic limbs. Um, and this presents a real um, hope for people with um, such things as uh, locked-in syndrome, where they often have, um, other than basic respiratory functions, muscular functions. They have almost no muscular control. Um, you might be familiar, viewers might be familiar with that phenomenon from the film The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, where uh, an entire book was uh, dictated by this patient 
Um, and he used only his uh, um, his ability to blink to dictate an entire book. Um, and there's real hope now that um, a much better way of doing that might be to uh, just directly read his brainwaves and train people with that, those types of disabilities to uh, to interface more easily and effectively with the world. Now, I myself have a physical disability, so I'm very interested in this kind of technology. Uh, when do you think uh, this kind of technology is going to be available to someone like me? And then also, when do you think it's going to be available for everyone? Like very basic systems uh, for um, th that basically read the difference between alpha and delta waves are available now. Like I can, um, the company, um, one company that does this work is Interaxon, um, and they have uh, cognitive trainers that do just directly read your brain waves, and they're available as like iPad applications. So those, uh, and I'm fairly certain you can just buy them on iTunes. Um, and get the appropriate, uh, I think it's a single sensor on the, uh, on the prefrontal cortex. So it's just really a headband. Um, so that's available now. And as much as that seems science fiction, it's, um, when you get right into the computing of it, um, and the science behind it, again, the mystery dissolves into just a set of basic engineering problems. Um, the the possibility of like robotic limbs and actual movement um, might be quite a bit farther away um, because it's and I, I hesitate to give accurate uh, predictions because that's always it's basically like rolling a die at this point. Um, I was aware I I, I spent uh, an internship at Harvard University and was living with. Um, a number of people at MIT that were in their robotics lab. And even actually the basic robotics behind doing something like having a pair of ro robotic legs or a, a, a computerized arm that can catch a ball in real time, like just a, a, an arm that can play catch with you, is um, often incredibly complicated. Um, and there's various different com computational problems that happen there. With actual direct interfacing with um, with the mind for something like um, having moving a robotic arm or um, potentially even having someone with um, the ability to have locomotion, like um, leg movement, could potentially set another completely different set of um, engineering problems. As tempting as it is to think that, that we could have, just as I described before, a headband that would like read your premotor cortex or your motor cortex and just understand that that particular set of readings meant walk and in this direction. Um, the brain really isn't organized in that way. Um, for instance, uh, walking, like actual locomotion, it isn't even really processed in um, in the motor cortex at all. It's in the mesencephalon locomotion area, which is more close. It's much closer to the brain stem. So even experiments that happened in I'd say like the late 1950s had uh, decerebrate cats, cats that had their um, entire cortex, their entire brain. Um, anatomically removed, could still do things like walk on um, a treadmill. And that was just purely because the, the operation behind um, basic locomotion is, uh, is completely free from the rest of your brain. Um, there are other examples, actually very explicit examples, in much, much of the muscular system. You'll have to forgive me because this is kind of from memory, but um, one of the most basic systems in your entire um, motor apparatus is your uh, the Golgi tendon organ, 
which is probably the sim simplest neurocircuit in the entire body. Um, and it's not in the brain at all. It's actually in various places, um, usually in the dorsal root of your spine. Um, and it consists only of two neurons, one sensory and one mo motor. And it's used to detect a level of stretch um, in the muscular system. So the uh, patellar reflex, the one that most people have for their doctor, where they're just tapped on the leg with a small hammer, and given that uh, and their leg jerks up slightly, that's actually just a function of the uh, Golgi tendon organ, and that's completely free from the brain. And as a reflex, of course, it has to be. It has to be um, almost by definition completely free from conscious control. Now, um, that's probably the most familiar example of how the Golgi tendon organ might work, but um, that's one tendon in an entire body full of muscles. So doing things like keeping your standing balance do rely um, on the ability to detect stretch and to re react to it in incredibly quick areas um, in uh, time time periods. I mean. So doing things like a slight um, change in balance could actually um, present a, a large number of computing problems, and some of them might not even be under direct conscious control. So even the most basic question of where do we take the readings from uh, comes into uh, into a, a serious dispute. Um, that being said, I, I know that um, it would be quite possible that people make artificial um, Golgi um, tendon organ apparatuses that are built into the system, so sort of decentralizing the computational process over a wide variety of programs. Um, that is probably the way that it would likely be developed, but I, I doubt that we'd have serious sort of models um, before another five years, and it might be even doubtful if we'd ever have them. But I think it could be quite possible that we'd have some kind of working model that would um, that you could train people on probably within the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, it just it might not look the way we're picturing it now, or that we or have all of the features we'd like to have, but certainly. Um, you can see now that there's a number of, of very specific problems that come up, but at the same time, there's equally um, ingenious people trying to solve these problems all of the time and f figure out um, interesting ways around um, around those uh, computational issues. So I, at the same time as I don't want to be too hopeful, I don't want to be too disparaging or underestimate the intelligence as some of the, the people working exactly on these problems. Um, so I think 10 years would be, a, 10 or 20 years would be a, a good time period to at least see prototypes or, or people begin to look at these, these possibilities in sort of pilot studies. Obviously, uh, I understand how difficult it is to make an accurate prediction with this sort of thing, but I will definitely get some information from you about current technology, and I thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you very much.